Dr. Austin is director of the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS, at the NIH. Dr. Austin leads the center's work to improve the translation of observations in the lab, clinic, and community into interventions that reach and benefit patients, from diagnostics and therapeutics to medical procedures and behavioral changes. Under his direction, NCATS researchers and collaborators are developing new technologies, resources, and collaborative research models, demonstrating their usefulness, and disseminating the data. Dr. Austin is, a train, is trained as a clinician and a geneticist, and he is a member of the National Academy of Medicine, formerly the Institute of Medicine. Please welcome Dr. Christopher Austin. I feel like I'm on a game show here, with, coming behind the curtain. Um, so uh, it's great to be here, and uh, it's always great to come to uh, the OSU. Um, I've, I've been instructed that I have to use the proper pronoun. Um, <clears throat> um, and it, it, um, I've been here several times before, and I always learn a huge amount whenever I come. And, and so it's, it's great, to, great to be here. And, and, you have a remarkable leadership here uh, in Becky and the others um, who, who run uh, this wonderful um, uh, Center for Clinical Translational Science. And so congratulations to everything that, that you're doing here. And thank you to Becky, wherever she went. There she is. Um, um, so uh, what, what uh, Becky asked me to do uh, was to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing in AI, and <clears throat> AI has become, uh, for those of you who will remember this analogy, uh, the current uh, version of Dustin Hoffman and the graduates in plastics. Um, you know, it seems like everything, every problem in the world is gonna be solved by AI and machine learning, which it may be, um, but uh, I suspect we're at, uh, we're doing what human beings uh, do so well, which is to, uh, as um, has been said many times by many wise people, overestimate the, um, uh, the, the impact of technology in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. Um, and presumably we will go through this hype cycle uh, through AI and machine learning, uh, and then it will crash at some point uh, and, then, uh, and then come back and, and really contribute in major ways, I think, and I think all of us do, uh, or most of us do. Uh, to the kind of work that, that, uh, that we're engaged in here. And I'm going to try to give you a sense of why I think this is particularly the case in translational science. Um, and, and so let's, let's uh, get started. So uh, before I get into this, I, I just want to say that... Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I knew if this didn't work out this way that I would be talking to people who were who were uh, perhaps so disconsolate that they wouldn't listen to what I had to say. But now, uh, uh, the world is all is well. Um, I have um, men, I have in-laws who are uh, uh, Michigan fans and and are disconsolate, and uh, but they're going for shock therapy for their depression today, so they'll be better. Okay, so uh, so this is the problem uh, that we work on. It's the problem that you work on. Uh, I think it is the problem uh, for biomedical research in our era, which is that during my professional lifetime in the last uh, 30 years or so, uh, there has uh, become a, 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 a remarkable split between uh, progress in fundamental science and progress in, uh, in, in treating and preventing disease. Uh, and, if, and if you think of what's on the left side, uh, fundamental research is is almost unrecognizable compared to where when it was where it was when I was uh, in training and, and in the lab uh, to beginning uh, to begin with in the mid to late 80s, um, uh, you know, compared to what a graduate student could do then and can do now, uh, it, it's just it's just a, a really a, a epical change. Uh, and and whether that's uh, uh, we use of, uh, as examples of that the Human Genome Project uh, or uh, or the a photo on the bottom left are embryonic or uh, iPS cells, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, which are differentiating into neurons and putting out uh, neurites. You know, this was this really was science fiction um, uh, 35 years ago, and it's not anymore. So we know more about ourselves in health and disease than we ever have by orders of magnitude. But if you ask yourself, how how has health changed? 
health care changed and the, and the experience of an individual patient change during that time. And you think about your own experience, the last time you went to a doctor, if you've been a doctor recently and you compare it with uh, those who've been alive for 30 years, uh, what it was like when you went 30 years ago, for the most part, it's, it's the same, except your clinician doesn't, uh, doesn't look at you anymore. They're looking at their iPad and typing. But, but other than that, it's pretty much the same. In my own field of neurology, I mean, the, the, the fundamental science of neuroscience and neurology has, has, is, is leaps and bounds. Uh, above what it was uh, 30, 35 years ago, and yet uh, virtually every disease that was untreatable 35 years ago is untreatable now. You know, whether you think about, uh, about ALS or Alzheimer's disease or Huntington's disease or intractable pain or stroke, or they, 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 really nothing has changed in the experience of a patient. And, and it's an interesting thing to ask yourself, well, why has this happened? I mean, to, to the degree that, that what's on the right side is supposed to uh, 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 develop from what's on the left side, that is, uh, uh, you know, improvements in understanding of fundamental biology and, 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 and uh, human physiology and health and disease are supposed to lead to improvements in health. That's, that's what we all believe, and I think it is true. Why has one outstripped the other? And that gap is the translational gap that all of us need to think very hard about how we're gonna solve. Because unless we solve that problem, we will ha have a wonderful uh, uh, a tower of knowledge uh, and wonderful libraries, but our patients will continue to be sick and die. Uh, I think unnecessarily. And so I think our systems uh, uh, have to change and adapt, and the kind of science we do has to change and adapt to this new reality. And, and the new reality, uh, is, is one of great optimism and hope and possibility, but like most things, what got us here won't get us there. And so uh, this, the CTSA program uh, and, and all of what NCATS does is really at the, at the vanguard of, of, of trying to create that new ecosystem that, that we need. Um, so so this, is, this is a graph that I, I know Becky's seen me show a hundred times, but it's, it, it, it's sort of, um, it's, it's, a, it's a visual representation of what I'm talking about. What, you, what you're looking at here is the number of disorders in online inheritance in man and OMIM, um, uh, number of human conditions, the molecular basis of which is understood. Uh, and I always say when I was studying for the boards in the late 80s, it was easy to study for the boards because there were less than 10 human conditions, the molecular basis of which was known. Um, and, and, and now that number is well over 6,000 uh, in the last 30 years. We've gone from 10 to over 6,000, about 6,500, uh, and there's about 250 new ones every single year. Uh, and, 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 and this is due, in case you're wondering uh, where, this, where this came from, this is due to the sequencing phase of the Human Genome Project. That's really where this came from. The majority of these are, uh, are rare Mendelian disorders, but certainly not all. Uh, but, but from a patient standpoint, this is what's important, that there's only 500 of these that have any treatment. Um, most people, and, and you may not realize that 95% of human diseases have no regulatory approved treatment whatsoever. 95% of diseases. Uh, and, and so this is an enormous, enormous challenge, but also an enormous opportunity. And, and 30, 35 years ago, it was, it, we could get away with saying, well, we don't, we don't know what causes these things. How can we possibly uh, begin to intervene and treat them? We can't say that anymore. We do know what causes them. We do understand, in many cases, if not most cases, the basic biochemistry and genetics and biology which, which causes these diseases. So I think it is our scientific responsibility, our medical responsibility, and yes, our moral responsibility to figure out how to, how to make the, this, the, the, the red uh, 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 bar uh, be, uh, be a little bit better uh, uh, compared to the, to the yellow bar there. Now, you might say, well, gosh, you know, if you think about this from a drug perspective or a behavioral intervention or a device, whatever it is, you probably know the numbers that it takes about 15 years to develop uh, an intervention once you have a, a, a fundamental uh, discovery that you're going to intervene on, a target, uh, if you will. And you might say, well, gosh, all we have to do is wait 15 years, and the number of therapeutics will, will, will do this too. It's, it's just going to be right-shifted by 15 years. Well, unfortunately, you would be wrong uh, if you thought that because, uh, because of something that uh, I have to show you now. And, and uh, in order to tell you, uh, give you context, I've got to show you this. So this is Moore's Law. I hope you know what Moore's Law is. If you don't, 
please don't admit it. Um, you can Google it once I'm done talking. Moore's Law will allow you to Google it. Uh, uh, what, what, it what it represents is, is a fundamental change which has happened in, in our society in the last uh, 50 years uh, due to uh, the uh, 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 in information technology. It's the observation by Gordon Moore, who was one of the founders of Intel, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that the number of uh, transistors you can fit on a microprocessor increased uh, linearly and the cost decreased linearly um, uh, over the course of about 50 years. And this is why you could fit a supercomputer from the 80s into an iPhone uh, these days. And it's absolutely transformed everything that we do, uh, in, uh, in, including in medicine, and made AI, frankly, possible. Uh, but but you, then you ask, well, how are we doing in, in, in uh, therapeutic development during this time? And, and this is what it looks like. It's the opposite. And, and this is a profoundly important graph that I, I want you to burn into your hippocampus. Um, uh, which, which shows uh, monotonically negative productivity growth in therapeutic development since the 1950s, such that the number of new drugs approved by the FDA uh, has, has uh, per billion dollars, so somebody hands you a billion dollars, how many drugs do you get? The number of drugs you get for a billion dollars has gone down by half every nine years since 1950. Now, now, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about uh, shoes or ball bearings or cars or drugs. When you, have an, when you have a process or an industry, if you want to think of it that way, if you want to think of us as part of the industry of making therapeutics, that, uh, the, whose productivity decreases by half every nine years since 1950, for the last 60, 70 years, What's going to happen? Well, the, 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 the organizations that are involved in doing this are going to go out of business or they will buy each other or acquire each other and the products that they do make uh, will be exorbitantly expensive. And I just described the pharmaceutical industry for you or healthcare in general. So it, it's, it's absolutely predictable from the productivity uh, 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 history of, of therapeutic, therapeutic development. And, and what's really frightening about this graph is, think about what's happened during this time. Invention of computers, recombinant DNA, the Genome Project, gene therapy, all these things, none of them have had any effect on, on this decreasing productivity, which is exactly the opposite from what's supposed to happen. Many people actually think that all those data actually have contributed to this by creating so much, inform so much data that, that it creates all these hypotheses that leads people in wild goose chases and, and, and it actually decreases productivity and it would be better if we didn't know as much. That's actually, so, so, it's a logical um, uh, possible explanation. But, but the important thing about this is that this graph and others I will tell you, other facts I will tell you, should tell us that we cannot continue doing what we're currently doing that continue doing what we're doing and expecting a different result is that famous definition of stupidity or insanity, depending on who you want to listen to, uh, and is never going to get us there. So, so, so we need to rejigger ourselves and, and, and think about what, what can turn this curve. Uh, it, for those of you who are, uh, who are thinking, you know, if you look at this, okay, when does this graph go to zero? When does this line go to zero? It actually can't officially go to zero because it's a log plot. Uh, but it becomes asymptotic in about 2050. So as, unless something changes, which has been the case since 1950, there will be no more drugs after 2050. Or in other words, the cost of new drug will be infinity, which is pretty much the same thing. So, so, so it, innovation is absolutely essential. Uh, 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 not, not just a nice to have, it's a, it's an, it's a must have, uh, especially for those of you uh, who are not uh, Becky's age and my age and, and others, you know, we'll, we'll be dead by this time. But for the, you know, for the trainees here, uh, this is even more urgent um, uh, 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 to solve this problem. Okay, so wh what I learned when I was in training is actually not true. So when I was in training, I was taught this is all I had to do. So I'm a neurologist. I was taught all I had to do is make a clinical diagnosis. That's what neurologists do. Uh, and, and as a geneticist, that's all I do too, right? I mean, you have an A to T change, have a nice day. Uh, and, and I thought that's all I had to do. Uh, and, 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 and I thought that that the, 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 the interventions, the drugs, the devices, the behavioral interventions, would just happen by themselves. As the night follows the day, these things would follow once the fundamental pathogenesis was, was identified. But, but, of course, this isn't true. This isn't the same thing 
as having a drug or device. This process is not a thermodynamically favored process, which many, many, many people think it is. And most of our policymakers in Washington think it is. Uh, and, and furthermore, even when you have a drug or device or behavioral intervention, that also is not the same thing as all the people who need it actually getting it and, and benefiting from it. And, and it, the current numbers are it takes 15 years to go from number one to number two, and another 15 years or even more to go from the middle to the right. So for every, every disease, every symptom, 30 years to go from one side to the other, and it, and it has a failure rate of over 99%. So, so the question for us, for today at least, is how, how could AI or machine learning uh, uh, contribute to solving these inefficiencies? Or, or, or getting rid of these inequalities, because those inequalities are the translational problem, if you want to think of it that way. And, and I, at least for one, am very optimistic that, that there is enormous potential here, because what I see in everywhere I look is, is, a, is, is in translation, and one of the problems with translation is, and it's been referred to in some of the earlier talks, it's, it's an almost a relentlessly empirical process, translation is. Uh, it, it, it's a trial and error process. And, and the problem is that as you go from a protein in a tube to a cell to a tissue to a, 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 an inbred uh, animal uh, to, uh, to a, cl a clinical trial in humans to uh, what a friend of mine likes to call free-range humans, you know, people in the community, because that's where, that's where health happens, that the number of, of, of degrees of freedom increases by several orders of magnitude. Right? So a 20-step process, increasing number of degrees of freedom. The likelihood of your getting successfully from the beginning to the end with a trial and error approach is, approach is zero. And that's exactly what you see. But the answer to this is, is not to do what you often hear. Well, we just need more, more shots on goal. Well if, well, if you have a process which has a 10 to the minus 3 success rate, and, and you double the number of projects you do, double the number of shots on goal, well, then you have a 2 times 10 to the minus 3 success rate. Woo! That's break out the bubbly, right? No. You know, we, we have to, we have to, uh, to, to focus on, on interventions which are, or uh, uh, development, science, which is going to give us tenfold, hundredfold improvements uh, in, 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 in this process. And, and I think AL, AI and, and ML can help us do that. Okay, so, so what, what is NCAT's mission? Uh, I hope, since many of you are funded by us, I hope you also have memorized this and it's like the Pledge of Allegiance every morning you say this. Uh, but in case you don't, uh, our, our purpose uh, really fits well into, uh, into, the, into the, the, the subject of the meeting today, which is that, that NCATS is all about developing new ways of doing things, new technologies, new paradigms, new methods to make the process of intervention development and deployment better, faster, cheaper. That's, that's, that's our whole purpose. Um, and, 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 and so uh, innovative methods and technologies, that's, that's what we're talking about today. Um, so so I, I always have to say, again, you may have memorized these, these definitions, but I always have to I uh, always uh, feel like I, sh I should um, uh, uh, define these terms because people use them in different ways. Um, what do we mean by translation? We use a very holistic definition here uh, for translation. That is the process of going from, uh, from an observation to an intervention. An observation that a, a scientist in a lab, the doc's in the community, a, public, a, pub a doc in the office or a public health worker in the community makes where an observation uh, is made for the first time, a light bulb goes on, and the person says, well, gosh, if I could reverse this thing in front of me, uh, I, could, I could reverse the cellular pathology or the disease or the community health problem in front of me. The whole process from that ideation, from that light bulb going on to making the, the, the intervention, the drug, the device, the physical thing, and then showing that it does what you thought it would do, in increasingly complex systems and eventually in the community, because again, that's where health happens, that whole process is, is translation. So, so, so what is translational science? Because NCATS, of course, is, is not the National Center for Translation. Every institute and center at the NIH does some of this, and every biopharmaceutical company does some of this as well. Uh, translational science is like any other science. It's a field of investigation. It's a field of investigation that seeks to understand what the general principles are by which this process happens. With the thesis that like any other science, if we understand what the general principles are, 
we will transform this, this endeavor that we are all engaged in from a trial and error phenomenological process to a predictive science that will have dramatically improved uh, 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 success rate, uh, decreased failure rate, decreased cost, uh, increased efficiency, et cetera. And if you think about what's happened in my own field of genetics in the last, uh, during, again, my professional lifetime, this has happened. Um, you know, when I was in training, actually in college, it was the end of uh, the period of, of, of empiricism uh, and observation and inductive reasoning um, from, uh, in genetics, uh, going, back to Hen to going back to Mendel, um, and, and, and you look at the predictive power of genetics now, uh, that's the kind of thing that we want to happen in translation as well. Okay, so th this is often the problem list. Those of you clinicians, you'll know what a problem list is. Uh, this, is this is the problem list of the translational science patient. Uh, these are uh, a, a partial list of the problems that NCATS works on. They are the problems that bedevil every translational project. I don't care if you're working on psoriasis or Alzheimer's disease. They're all the same problems. And if you think about the, 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 those problems which are amenable to uh, computational approaches, uh, whether we call it AI or ML or machine intelligence or whatever we want to call it, uh, 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 all of these are. So the majority of what we work on uh, are, are, can be helped by these technologies. Why is that? It's because translation and NCATS, as, as, a, as the institute that supports that, is a fundamentally integrative center. You know, if you're going to deduce general principles, then, then you have to look in, 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 a, in a holistic way from the beginning of the translational process to the end, and you have to look for processes which cut across diseases, whether they're common to diseases or common to the translational process. So that means that everything we do is, is based on gathering and comparing large amounts of data. It's just, it's just part and parcel of, of, of everything that, that, that translational science does. Okay, so... Uh, I thought I would show you this, not because, we have, not because we're personally involved in the All of Us Research Program, but because uh, originally Becky had the words precision medicine in my title, so I, I thought I would tell you this. It is relevant for what you're doing, uh, and so I thought I'd just show you two uh, slides of the current status of the All of Us Research Program, which is otherwise known as the Precision Medicine Initiative. Um, this is the initiative that NIH started um, a number of years ago um, to collect uh, a million or more individuals across the country uh, and, uh, and follow them longitudinally over many decades uh, together with uh, environmental data and um, uh, demographic data and genome data um, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, provide the grist for the kind of precision medicine studies that we all want to do. Uh, and, and where we are now, this is about, uh, we're about a third of the way there, about 344 individuals who have started the enrollment process, 222,000 have fully enrolled. There's about, um, about 3,400 new people a week, which is a pretty good rate. Um, and, uh, and, and so the, the, I think the, the, the program is really on track for, uh, for delivering the million patients. The, the current uh, challenge here is to go from uh, the, the sort of bulk recruitment, which is what they've been doing through the health systems, to what's called DV, uh, and that's direct volunteer. You probably remember that a, a key part of this program is that, that in order to reach populations who are, tr who, are, who are traditionally excluded from this kind of work, that you, 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 couldn't, you couldn't just go to Kaiser or Geisinger uh, and, 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 and recruit them. I mean, they're great too, uh, but, but, but you want to have people who don't have health insurance, uh, for instance, and can go to the Walgreens and sign up, and so uh, that's a big part of this program too. Uh, and and uh, genomics is, is only uh, a part of this, but the important thing is that there is uh, genomic analysis, either exomes or whole genomes, that are going to be done on all of these patients. Uh, and the important uh, thing, uh, 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 an important thing about this, and you'll notice this, it's under, underlined here, responsible return of genomic information uh, to patients. This is something which um, our ethicist colleagues are spending a lot of time working on. Uh, that is, wh what is, and you heard about it this morning, what is responsible to return to patients? All data? All results, just the ACOG set, what do you return? Um, but, but a fundamental part of this program is that all the participants get all their data. 
They get all their personal data, and then they get aggregate data from everybody else. So, uh, so watch this space. Uh, there is a workbench on the web now if you want to take a look at it, uh, where you can do some manipulation of the first 200,000 people, which isn't a bad set. Um, so, uh, uh, but, but it's really growing uh, rather dramatically. Okay, so back to NCAT. So uh, I hope you know the person on the, on the right. Uh, uh, if you don't, um, <clears throat> You might want to do that if you want to stay employed, um, but but you might you might not know the person on the left who is the person who runs the program uh, from NCATS, and and you know a lot about the CTSA program, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this. I thought what I would do is is give you. Uh, some ideas about things that you might might know less about that NCATS is doing, but the important thing is that that we think of this program as an absolutely unique uh, 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 national treasure, national resource. Uh, 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 it's, it's upwards of about 60 uh, academic health uh, centers uh, across the country, um, uh, uh, and and if you if you can believe this, we have uh, uh, 60 Becky Jacksons, which, which is just or 60 people who want to be Becky Jackson, uh, or 59 people who want to be Becky Jackson and one person who already is. Uh, but, but the point is that that, that is absolutely unprecedented in, in, in terms of our ability to, to make these kinds of quantal changes that are needed. Um, so collaboratively facilitating and accelerating the translational problems that are on that list that I showed you, uh, operational and scientific uh, innovation that you're doing already, um, and uh, domain-specific translational science, and something that I'm uh, intensely committed to and uh, working on is the, the creation of an academic discipline of translational science. I feel quite strongly that, in, that the only way that this is going to work is if we have academic de departments of translational science which have the same panache as biochemistry and genetics, but have different promotion and tenure structures, different uh, that will be team-based and will be doing not fundamental research, I mean, we love fundamental research, right? But the, we're doing translational research, which is different. And the outcomes are different. Uh, and they should be different. Um, and so we, that was another thing that we're working on. Uh, in case you, you don't know, there are two things that we've developed over the last few years, which I, I think will feed into the, the AI world. Uh, and they are uh, uh, taking advantage of of, of, the, of the, 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 the remarkable breadth and depth of the CTSA network and community. One of them is the Trial Innovation Network that you probably know about already. I know you've done some work with that um, uh, here at Ohio State. Uh, and the other one is something called the ACT Network, the Accrual for Clinical Trials a Network. Uh, this one uh, was initially started out uh, to do clinical trial recruitment, which as you probably know, those of you who work in clinical research you know is, a, is an enormous limitation uh, to doing efficient clinical studies. And so we looked across the CTSA program and it was evident to us that across all of these, there are about 200 million people taken care of across all of these institutions. Uh, and because uh, these institutions are, spoke, are, are hub and spokes, they're not only tertiary academic health centers, but they're also uh, um, uh, PBRNs, they're community hospitals, uh, 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 federally qualified health centers, uh, really quite diverse uh, groups of, of, of healthcare organizations, and then multiply that by 60 across the country. It really is a remarkable uh, group, and essentially every um, most, at least, uh, uh, of the key opinion leaders in every area of biology and disease is also part of this program. So, so uh, the, the the thought of, gosh, if we could if we could tie this together into a national network for translational medicine, again, that would be absolutely transformational, and that's what we're in the process of doing. Uh, and you've been one of the leaders in doing this. Um, uh, th this is uh, where we are now. There's 42 of the 60 sites that are connected. Uh, we're, so we're currently at 125 million patients. I wanted to assure you that Ohio State is on this list. That's the big purple arrow. Uh, you may want to tell uh, Steve Reese that you should be under T, not O. Um, but uh, I will leave that up to you. Um, uh, okay, so, and, and I wanted to, uh, 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 tell you about some uh, additional things that we're doing in the clinical world, which I found were remarkably um, uh, 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 coincident with the person who was supposed to talk to you this morning, um, uh, but couldn't come in the end, but he's the guy in your booklet, uh, is from a company called AI Cure. And uh, NCATS happened to be the, the, the NIH Institute that gave AI Cure one of its first uh, uh, SBIR grants. Uh, so we're working not only within the, uh, the CTSA program and the, and the rare disease program that I'll tell you about in a second, but also through, uh, through the SBIR program uh, to develop 
uh, innovations in the, uh, in the clinical space, they, AIQR happens to work, at least at the time that we were working with them, they work particularly on the adherence problem. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, this is a smartphone app uh, 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 um, medication adherence program, uh, and uh, uh, the the person who was going to talk to you actually reports to Adam Hanina, uh, who was um, who was one of, who was the CEO of the company. And the remarkable thing about this is that that what I hear about the CTSAs and NCATs in general, I hear from the C, from the SBIR grantees as well, that if NCATs wasn't supporting these, they would have they would have gone out of business because nobody else supports this stuff, uh, and 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 we do. I'll give you another example in a second. Um, uh, another thing we're doing in AI uh, is, uh, is to worry about uh, the, uh, the, the implications, and you heard about this a little bit from uh, the, the ethics speaker um, from GW this morning, um, on machine intelligence in healthcare and the issues of trustworthiness, explainability, usability, and transparency. Uh, you, you probably know that uh, particularly in healthcare, uh, it's really important to be able to understand uh, and have trust in what these algorithms are telling us. Uh, and, and you saw this happen in the, in the Watson uh, episode in cancer a few years ago. And so we, uh, in order to uh, begin to think about what a research agenda would look like in this space and the sort of distal end of what we do in, in caring for patients and, and in community engagement, you know, what, 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 what are the issues that we should think about? Uh, and some of them were probably pretty obvious to you, uh, but they came out of the meeting. There was a meeting that was hosted by us, the uh, NCI and the NIBIB. Um, and it was really a remarkable uh, meeting. If you're interested, there's a workshop webpage that tells you who talked and, uh, and, and, and what some of the presentations were. Uh, there's a white paper that's, con that's in development that'll come out the first part of next year. It's a, uh, it's a big group uh, uh, paper, which is why it's taking a little bit longer. Um, but these are some of the issues that the group uh, came in, came up with. Uh, one was that this, uh, that this has to be a process as an experimental paradigm, that we have to, we have to develop these algorithms uh, and then integrate uh, monitoring and, and results uh, into this. That, that sometimes people tend to think, and we tend to have this sort of deus ex machina view of this, that you know, we could just create an algorithm and, and deploy it, and well, it's gonna work. Well, it's like any other scientific enterprise. The first time you do it, it probably won't work. And so you gotta gather data, adjust the algorithm, and, 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 and uh, it will develop over time. So creating a feedback loop on purpose, um, th this is something that, is harder than it sounds because a lot of the development here is going on in the commercial sector, and so they, they have an intense need to sell the product. And so it's another reason why I think it's absolutely essential that we have a robust academic discipline of AI that, 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 that is gonna have this, 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 this experimental scientific ethos. Um, so funding research, of course, uh, including implementation, something that uh, is big uh, at NCATS, but, but less so at some other places. Um, uh, clear explanations and justification of why we're using it to build trust uh, with the people who are gonna be uh, impl uh, impl um, um, uh, affected here, both the practitioners and the patients. Um, uh, incorporation of so social determinant health of health and health outcomes, and, and emphasizing transparency. Uh, something that the meeting uh, we at the meeting spent a lot of time talking about is is this this really major problem of bias uh, in in the data. Uh, I think you all know uh, what some of the issues are here. Um, uh, most of the data that are out there are in uh, in, uh, in 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 certain parts of the population and underrepresented minorities and rural populations uh, are, are, are underrepresented in most of the data that are going into these algorithms. And, and it's been shown that, 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 uh, that, that if, you, if, you, if you have an algorithm which, which is trained uh, in, in one population, it might predict that population's uh, outcomes but, uh, quite well, but, but in other populations, uh, outcome not, not so well. And, and this is something that we were very familiar with, I think, now in genomics, but it's something that, that, that the MI AI community uh, has, is, is just beginning to, to grapple with. And this is particularly a problem if you have an AI uh, uh, algorithm the, the, w w w in which you, don't, you, you can't explain how the result was deduced. And, and, and this is, and this is a, a common 
problem in AI uh, that the computer won't tell you what it's thinking. It will give you a result, but you can't figure out what it did to get you the result. So ma major issues here. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears now to rare diseases. Uh, and another reason why we have to think about MI and, and uh, 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 AI and ML. So you may not know, if you don't think about rare diseases every day, that there are about 7,000 of these. Uh, about 80% of them are genetic. Um, um, the ones that you've all heard of, sickle cell disease, Huntington's, uh, those cyst cystic fibrosis, et cetera, you probably heard of, but there are many, many, many others. Uh, and interestingly, the number uh, is about 250 new rare diseases being identified every year, uh, which I find a, a really interesting observation. But they are, of course, by definition, individually rare, but they're cumulatively common. And, and, and this is why uh, the, the, the title of the slide is what it is. Rare diseases are a public health issue. That, that, that the uh, accumulatively, patients with rare diseases make up about 8% of the population, which is the same prevalence as type 2 diabetes. But I imagine everybody you know knows a lot about type 2 diabetes, and I would imagine most people that you know know nothing about rare diseases. But rare diseases are the cause of disproportionate uh, suffering, premature death, and very high health care costs. Um, and they're largely for reasons that we could talk about, if you're interested, invisible to the health system because of the way they're coded. Um, accurate diagnosis uh, currently uh, requires, on average, about 10 years. Uh, so these are patients or parents who are going from provider to provider to provider, racking up huge health care costs, no clear diagnosis, no accurate diagnosis, and therefore no accurate intervention. All the time, the health of their child or themselves is decreasing. Um, and, and finally, they walk into a practitioner's office who says, oh, I know what you have. I saw one of these in medical school. But, but you've got to go to a thousand different practitioners until you find one. Now, now in this era, that is somewhere between dumb and inexcusable, right? I mean, we have something called the Internet, right, which, which you know, solves problems like this. And, 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 and so these problems... That's the point I'm, I'm going to try to make. I'm going to go back and forth between depressing you and, and, and exciting you because they are big problems, but they're solvable. But we just have to work in different ways. Um, so um, a, 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 a number which, which I hope will also stick in your head, only about 5% of rare diseases have a, have a treatment. I told you that before, but at the current rate, it will be 2,000 years. 2,000 years before every rare disease is treatable. So... Again, if that number doesn't tell you we've got to do something differently and dramatically differently, I don't know what will. Because if you're a parent with somebody, that they're probably, given the size of the crowd, there's probably about 10 people in this room who themselves or their family member have a rare disease, uh, and, uh, and, and, and you can't wait that long. So what's the solution here? is to transition from a one disease at a time, these diseases are all independent, to a many diseases at a time approach. We've multiplexed in every other area of biology, but we haven't done it in diseases before. And so we're very focused on commonalities among diseases, platform technologies for disease, for diagnosis and treatment, and machine learning and AI is absolutely central in our ability to do these kinds of things. Okay, so uh, we have a number of things that we're doing in, in rare diseases that uh, a number of the CTSAs are involved in, as well as the Office of Rare Diseases at NIH. Uh, one is uh, providing information and big data on all these disorders, uh, empowering patients as research partners, uh, interoperable registries for all of these diseases, uh, and natural history and intervention studies that I don't have time to get into. Uh, but all of these are generalized platforms where, one, where all of these diseases uh, can, can, can have a standard treatment or a standard group of data uh, uh, gathered so that then one can compare uh, disease A with disease F with disease uh, AA to look for commonalities among them. Because, of course, they're all related. We just don't know how. Um, on the preclinical side, I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of, of where we're using AI. The, the reason I show you this is to show you what the structure of the organization is. It's a really quite uh, unique, again, uh, organization. Um, uh, the, 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 the structure here is that it's, this is about 250 people or so uh, who are resident at NCATS, uh, and they have expertise in all of these things, uh, all those boxes in the middle. 
um, but, uh, but, they, but every project they do is a collaboration with somebody. We have a number of projects with investigators at Ohio State, and those investigators are stuck at some point in those purple arrows at the top, and then depending on where they get stuck, they apply to one or more of these uh, programs in the boxes, they get put on a joint project team, and then their individual project gets moved uh, down the translational pipeline here, uh, and, and deliverables come out the bottom. And, and for, uh, so, and, but these are importantly, these are dual use projects that they, they move an individual project forward in an efficient way, uh, but they also tell us something about how to do this better the next time, and that's the paradigm technology development. Um, and, and I was just gonna uh, uh, give you a couple of examples of new things that we're doing in this space uh, using AI, and, and I'll try to give you a sense of why we're doing this. Um, so uh, in early translation discovery of new probes, that's a term, uh, sort of a term of art, that means a, generally a small molecule compound or an SI or a, a CRISPR uh, that allows you to understand uh, understudied protein targets. Uh, development of novel computational approaches uh, to advanced drug development um, and new techniques for computer aided drug design. And I'll just give you a couple of examples of these. Uh, the first is uh, is another SBIR program that we did uh, with a program called uh, a company called Recursion. Again, we were the first people to fund this uh, little company that was started by a, a second year graduate student at the University of Utah who uh, got so frustrated by his inability uh, to uh, study more than one disease at a time um, that he left graduate school. Uh, it, it, not that I'm recommending you do that. Don't leave graduate school, stay graduate. <laughs> I can see all the, all the advisors are getting nervous when I say that. Uh, actually, he and, his, and his, his advisor actually started this company together. And, and what the company uh, is doing uh, is using something called cell painting, which is something from Ann Carpenter's lab at MIT, um, or at the Broad, uh, to, uh, to be able to profile the responses, cellular responses uh, to uh, hundreds of, of diseases simultaneously and the, and the effects of drugs on those diseases so that, so that instead of studying one disease at a time, they're studying dozens or hundreds of diseases at a time. Uh, and, and this was a completely wacky idea when they started, which is why nobody would fund them. Uh, but they now, uh, as Chris Gibson, who is that uh, graduate student or was that graduate student, uh, he did go on to get his PhD, you'll be glad to know. Um, uh, it, it helped legitimize the project, and now uh, they have a large staff, a number of projects in phase two, and a bunch of awards, a bunch of uh, collaborations with a number of drug companies. But, so, but the point here is, that, that, that there are good ideas, but this is a completely different way of thinking about drug screening for uh, diseases than is conventionally done. And, and to us, that's very attractive, but to most funders, it wasn't. So, uh, so, so uh, again, you need to know that we're think different kind of people uh, at NCAT, so the, the, the more different in many ways, the better. Um, and, and here's a good example. Um, a, a, a really interesting uh, problem that I've worked on for a lot of years uh, and which I still am endlessly fascinated by uh, and which I think AI will be able to contribute a lot to is this problem of chemical space. Um, uh, it, something that, some things that you may not know is that uh, even, um, well, you, I, I've told you already that 95% of human diseases have no treatment, no regulatorily approved treatment. But what I haven't told you is that now, even 15 years after the completion of the Genome Project, 90% of, of targets encoded by the human genome have, have no, uh, uh, no chemical matter, no, dr no drug-like molecule to manipulate them. 90% of targets have, have, no, have no probes available with them, or in other words, are, are undrugged in the vernacular. Uh, and, and, but what's interesting about this is when you ask, well, how many potential drugs are there? And here's when it really gets interesting. So number of potential targets, maybe 10 to the 6, a million maybe, encoded by the human genome. That's a, we don't really know, but that's probably about right. The number of potential drugs is 10 to the 60. That's 10 with 60 zeros, which is about the number of atoms in the known universe. That's the number of potential drugs that could be synthesized. So I think it is fair to say that no matter how good you are as a chemist, you will never make any appreciable amount, a percentage of the total drugs that could be made. But the question is, if you want to manipulate that other 90% and be able to manipulate 
any target encoded by the human genome or a pathogen genome at will, you have to know what part of that 10 to the 60 goes with that 10 to the 6. It's a really interesting question. You know, it's like what our kids did or we did in, in school, you know, where you have a list on one side and a list on the other. And, you know, you draw a line between, you know, apple, orange, car, truck, and you have 10 to the 6 targets on one side, and you have 10 to the 60 structures on the other, and you're just drawing lines between them. But there's a lot of lines. So the question is, how do you solve this problem? And, and what's interesting, in the, in the entire history of synthetic and medicinal chemistry, only about 10 million compounds have been made, Me, leaving, leaving 10 to the 53 left. So, so how do you do this? And, and uh, the, the, the last bullet here is, is uh, just a tad understated. The current approach to exploring chemical space is inefficient, <laughs> which to say the least, right? So what could AI do to help here? Well, it turns out a lot, uh, because it turns out that instead of having to choose on the basis of what has been made, screening collections contain about a million compounds, most of them, uh, which is really pathetic, one million out of 10 to the 60. It's just uh, infinitesimally small. So pe most people look under the light post. We, we've at our place done it too. Everybody does this. There's no, no other alternative. There, there are, however, some, uh, some computational databases, things like Chem Navigator, that have 10 to the 60, uh, which is still pretty good. Uh, uh, sorry, 10, 10, have 60 million, which is still pretty good. It's, it's much less than 10 to the 60, but it's, it's better than a million. But... But the, but the critical question is, how would you know which of those 10 to the 60 you would choose? And, and it turns out that human beings are completely incapable of, of, of being able to ask these kinds of questions, uh, but, but computers are really good at it. So uh, what we started to do, and all these data are published, and I'll, I'll give you the data at the end, but what, what we did was we looked at a couple of big databases, uh, something called Kemble, uh, looked at compounds and activities in, in Kemble, which is the, um, the um, uh, EMBL uh, chemical database and chemical activity database. It's the equivalent of PubChem, if you don't know what that is, uh, and, 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 and made uh, QSAR models, uh, qualitative structure activity models, uh, relationship models from those data. To, to try to predict what new structures uh, would, uh, would, would, hit, would hit new targets. And, and to do this, we, no, we use not only the Kemble data on the right, which uh, for, for those of you who do this kind of work, is, is relatively low quality data, because it's single point activity data, but it's, but it's many, many, many targets. So there's uh, about 200,000 compounds uh, and, and, uh, and, and about 50,000 uh, in, in a training set and about 50,000 in the test set, but it's, 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 it's relatively, uh, relatively uh, low quality data. And then on the other side is, is data that we've generated at our place through something called TOX21, which is, in, which is incredibly high quality data, but it's, it's not as abundant. So these are a, a, a data set where uh, each of about um, uh, 7,000 compounds were tested uh, at, uh, uh, at 15 concentrations uh, in triplicate. So very, very high quality, dense data. And, and the bottom line is if you, if you put these two together, uh, you can come up with uh, pretty good predictive algorithms. Uh, and, and this is where I get to play AI person. Uh, and <laughs> that is to say that what our informatics folks did is represent these molecules. So there's up that, that, uh, that thing in the, those, that heterocycle up there. Uh, there, are, there are computational ways to represent that uh, in a number of ways. Fingerprints is what they're called, uh, or descriptors. And, and using those, then one can do things, and this is my favorite part of the talk, where I get to say, well, using deep learning with ReLU, three to five hidden layers, and Atom Optimizer, drop out dense layers in ConvNet. I have no idea what I just said, but uh, that, that's what the computational people do uh, to be able to take these data, these molecular descriptors across hundreds of thousands of molecules and, and tens of thousands of activities uh, and, and develop uh, predictive algorithms uh, and, and all of this is uh, we've made public on our website, the predictor, all the, all the data, uh, all, the, all the algorithms, so you can download the algorithm, you can modify it, whatever you want, you can, you can kick the tires. It, it, it's the kind of thing that has to be done to, if I go back to the, the outcome of the, 
of the, um, the workshop that we had, this is what has to happen for people to have confidence in these algorithms, that people have to make their algorithms public so that other people can look at them. It's, just, you know, it's a basic tenet of science, but it doesn't tend to happen as much as it should in this field. So, uh, but, but you can go use it tomorrow if you want, and you see all those countries that have used it um, um, uh, and, uh, over, the last, um, over the last couple of years. So do, do go have a look. Um, uh, uh, another approach we're taking to this, which I find really exciting, um, is to explore chemical space uh, in, in, a, uh, in, a, in a really think different kind of way. So the idea here is could we uh, map biologically active chemical space uh, by creating a, a system which integrates automated biological screening, which we know how to do, with uh, automated chemical synthesis, which we're just learning to do. It's really a, 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 a frontier area, but it's developing rapidly. Automated synthesis, automated purification, automated screening, engineering, and computer science AI ML to create an a, a, a eventually autonomous chemical space crawler, which would which would start out with a hypothesis, make the compounds in an automated way, test them in uh, biological assays in an automated way, uh, be, uh, be analyzed by the computer brain in an automated way. That AIML system would then tell the synthetic machinery, the automated synthesis part of the, of the program, what new chemicals to make based on the results of the previous uh, round. And this would go around and around and around and around. You'd press go and come back 20 years later and it would all be done. This is actually possible. <laughs> we started this about two years ago and at the beginning, we had no idea whether this would actually be possible, but I'm, I'm here to tell you that it is. And it's, 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 it, we got a long way to go, but it's incredibly exciting. So, and you can see this is the, the purpose here. Um, uh, it's really quite a, oh, it's a typical NCATS uh, change the world um, uh, kind of vision, just like the CTSA program. And there's a paper here if you want to read about it. It's just two pages in Nature for Use Drug Discovery. But here's how it's supposed to work. And this is essentially what I just said, that, that uh, you, you would start out with a hypothesis uh, and then uh, you would design the molecules like I showed you before uh, in silico, and then those, those in silico designs would go to the automated chemical synthesis modules, and then they would be automated, uh, automatically purified, analytical chemistry, compound management, then they would go to the automated biological testing mod modules, and those results would then lead to uh, a modification or not of the therapeutic hypothesis based on the results, and then a new round would go, and this would go around and around and around and around. Another way to, uh, to view it is this way, is that you, know, you have uh, research biology in your own lab, uh, and then you could do high throughput uh, physical screens and silico screens, and then automatically you can do chemistry root planning, which is intensely uh, human at this point. Uh, the synthesis can be automated, the scale up, uh, can be automated, and this goes around and around. So uh, uh, just to show you one of the first ways we've done this has actually been uh, in, the, in the biology world, because this turns out to be the, mo it's the most developed, as you probably know, uh, uh, biology screening is more developed than automated chemistry. So this is a collaboration with a startup company in Boston called Kibotics, and they have combined uh, AI with robotics uh, to create advanced chemical, uh, chemicals and materials. You, you heard ref before, um, about the advances in material science that have happened, uh, carbon nanotubes and others, uh, uh, but you, those same advances can be applied to drug development and, and drug-like chemicals. And so the question here was, you know, anytime you go into the lab, you know if you're gonna do a massive experiment, and, and a massive experiment to us is test three million molecules uh, in multiple different concentrations in a biological assay. But the question is, is always what concentrations what are, the, what are the assay conditions? What buffer do you use? What time point do you use? What cells do you use? So there's an almost infinite number of assay conditions. And so usually what do you do? You guess, or you just get tired of optimizing it and you just do the freaking experiment and you hope you get something out of it. But, but you never actually test all the possibilities, right? So are you right or not? Well, who knows? So would it be nice to be able to know that you're doing the most optimal uh, 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 conditions in your individual experiment. Well, if you're going to do this individually, uh, uh, manually, it's just it's just impossible. 
uh, it, it, practically. Uh, but, but using these kinds of technologies, it might not be. So, so the opportunity here was to develop, test, and implement automated biology test platforms with a direct interface to informatics platforms. And, and what we did was we did this in two different ways. We did this via kabotics, via uh, an ML output that I'll show you in a second. And then we did the brute force at our place because we happen to have a robot that can work 24 seven. So we were able to do 512 different conditions in a single assay uh, and without having graduate students complain because uh, we've, replaced our graduate students with robots because they complain less. Uh, and uh, I think anybody would complain less than a graduate student. But anyway, that's a different talk. Uh, and so we have uh, this brute force method to compare uh, these results with. So, so what happened, so here, here's, here's what it is. It's a two-part system, right? There's the, there's the, the, the physical system, which is in, in Bethesda. And, and then there's the brain, which is sitting in Boston. Uh, and, and what happens is that, that uh, this, this company in Boston uh, thinks, of, thinks about uh, uh, an assay with specified conditions, uh, and for the geeks in the room, those are the computer folks. Th this is, this is how, how computer science people talk. You probably noticed this. Um, they talk this way at, 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 at cocktail party, too, you probably noticed. Um, and, and so what happens is that the kabotic system uh, enqueues a message to run an assay with specified conditions 500 miles away in, in Bethesda, and, and, and the system in Bethesda receives the message and creates a protocol uh, that's gonna be run with specified conditions, right? So we have, we, we have a protocol that comes in and it gets changed, uh, or a message, and that protocol gets changed into a protocol, and, and then the, the assay gets launched using the protocol that was programmatically generated. It's all, all, uh, there's no human here. It's automatically generated from the message that Kabotic sent. Uh, and, and then the plates are red. That is, these are all done in 1536 well plates, so multi-well plates. And those data are, are then sent to Kabotics, um, and, and the data is processed up in Boston. Uh, and, and then uh, the, the, the model, the AI model, uh, of which uh, condition uh, is the, 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 the Kabotics brain thinks is optimal, uh, it, 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 there's a hypothesis which is generated, and that hypothesis then leads to the next set of assay conditions. And this goes around and around and around uh, until uh, it, there's, a, there's an asymptotic result. And, and, uh, and, and, and it turns out that, um, um, I don't have time to show you the data, uh, you only have, instead of doing 512 conditions, you can do about 100 conditions with this kind of method uh, and this kind of design experiments um, uh, methodology to come up with the optimal assay. Um, and, and so it's, uh, and, but it's something which is also done completely independently of people. So, so this is, and this, is, this has already been done. So this is a reality, a reality today. Uh, finally, I want to tell you something about uh, another uh, AI-driven effort that we've done, which is, is really based on, on linguistics, actually. And, and the problem here uh, is a program called the Biomedical Data Translator Program. And it's, um, uh, it's, it, you might think about it as an informatics equivalent of, 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 of the Aspire program that I just showed you. Uh, the, the problem here is, and I love this terminology that was thought of uh, by Chris Schutt, somebody, some of you probably know who's uh, at Hopkins. He calls this crossing the chasm of semantic despair. So what does this refer to? This refers to the issues that all of you have every day when you are trying to talk to colleagues who, who are scientific or medical colleagues, but they speak a different tribal language than you do. They might be geneticists who speak in terms of dunce and rutabaga and bride of sevenless and ras. He's completely meaningless. You know, me, they, or they could be uh, pharmacology people who talk in terms of hill slopes and uh, and 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 other arcana, or they could be pathologists who who talk in terms of of, of caseating granulomas, right? You know, I love these kinds of terms that people use, uh, or they could be. They could be drug people who talk in these in, uh, inscrutable drug uh, names, or they could be the worst, who are physicians. Right, who also have this completely inscrutable language uh, with meaningless names, right? Things like in my own field is worse. Alzheimer's disease. Well, that tells us a lot about the pathology of that disorder, or Huntington's disease, or Hollywood and Spots disease. They're all named after people. They don't tell you anything. And so if you're trying to go, if you're trying to translate from a gene through a, 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 a pathway, a cell, 
uh, an organelle, pharmacology, genes to, 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 to diseases, it, it is literally impossible to go from one side to the other. And, and so projects, very good projects fail because there's no way to do the connections between, uh, 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 among all of the ways that you can characterize living systems in those various tribes with all of the other ways that you can characterize them. But let's say you had such a system and you, you had all of the ways that you can characterize uh, living systems from proteins to, to, uh, to genes to drugs to, to diseases and, and you had the many to many connections between each of them known in a giant 20 dimensional matrix which is what this is, and you could dive into the matrix at any one point and, and make all the relationships to any other way to characterize uh, living systems uh, in, in another part of the matrix, you would be able to, to generate uh, hypotheses and maybe even answers far, far more quickly. So let me give you an example. Where we first started this was in repurposing. So if you want to know, you got a drug, and you want to know what diseases it might be useful for. Well, wouldn't it be nice to know the, all the targets of this drug and then to know every cell type in the body that express that target and every pathway that that target is involved in and in every disease, which of those genes, targets, proteins, or pathways are disrupted and which, each of, those is, which, which of those is involved in which diseases? And, and you'd like to be able to answer that question like that. Currently, you cannot answer those questions. You can, you can answer a one-to-one -one question by looking at Google, but these kinds of, of Boolean uh, uh, inquiries, money-to-many Boolean requirements, uh, with, with many qualifiers, seven or eight qualifiers, which is how uh, biologists and, and, and uh, physicians think, you can't do it. So that's what this program started out to do. And much to my amazement now, about three years later, uh, we have a prototype that shows that this can actually be done. Um, and I'll just give you, give you an example here. So the whole purpose here, as, as I mentioned, was, was to explore knowledge in a computationally assisted way, in ways that human brains simply cannot and will never be able to do. There are just too many conditions, right? I mean, there, there's, there's 7,000 diseases, there's 30,000 uh, 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 genes, there's 10,000 drugs, there's, and you want to know the connections between all of them. And, and the other 17 ways that you can characterize health and disease. You can, a human brain will never be able to do that. So computationally assisted exploration of knowledge, construction of new hypotheses, of course. And we need a, a tool, an open source tool, which is what this is, that anybody can access will allow you to do this. Okay, so, um, so this is where we started. And just to show you, you know, again, this, when we started this, we had no idea whether it would work. So we did it in a completely uncon unconventional way. There's about 20 institutions uh, involved in this. Uh, we do it through something called the Transactions Authority, which uh, the cognizant of the NIH may know. It's, it's not a grant, it's a, not a contract. It's a very uh, deeply uh, collaborative program with, with these folks from uh, organizations all over the world. Um, and and these, uh, these, these, uh, these teams have sorted out into multiple sub-teams, and those teams are, 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 um, are fluid, and they reassort depending on what the need is uh, to, to, to develop part of the system. And I just want to give you a sense of how rapidly uh, this, this program developed uh, and, and, and how we're doing a lot of the development now. Um, this is a guy named Matt Might, who some of you may know, uh, who's one of the grantees now. Um, but, uh, but over the last two or now almost three years, we've gone from nothing uh, to a prototype, which I can show you in a second. But most of the work actually goes on in these hackathons now, um, uh, which are intense three to four to five day sessions with uh, now uh, 150 people all sitting around coding at the same time. And amazingly, 100 of those people, we do not pay. They're academics who come on their own because it's the greatest project they've ever done in their career, they tell us, so they come for free because it's so cool. So we pay 50 and 100, 100 come on their own. It's just, I've, I've, never, I've never had a program like that. Uh, but, that, but that's the kind of thing you can do when you do things differently. You can make headway amazingly quickly. And I just want to show you an example. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, maybe I can't get it to work. Oh, that's too bad. I was hoping I could show you well, I could, there's a, 
it doesn't matter. There was a, 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 a um, uh, animation up there I was going to show you of, of how all these teams interact with each other to solve these problems. And so uh, we have uh, something that you can take advantage of and would actually help us um, on our website now, uh, something called Tidbits. And the idea here is that we, we don't want to develop this platform as the canonical, you know, proverbial ivory tower, and then roll it out with, with you know, a color guard and great uh, fanfare, and have it be totally useless. Um, those of you who remember CA Big, I, I hesitate to say those words, but uh, those of you who know what I'm talking about uh, know what I'm talking about. We don't want to do that. And so we wanted to be clear, we wanted to be sure that this would actually be useful to solve real problems that individual people have. So what's the easiest way to do it? How do you do that? Well, it's called community engagement, right? I mean, you guys know what that is. You know, you know what that is. But here, the community is not a community of patients, it's a community of researchers. So we reach out to researchers and say, what do you want to know? Give us a problem. This is like, and we've modeled this, believe it or not, after are you smarter than a third grader? That, that's what it's doing. Uh, and, and so the translator team then goes and solves the problem, puts it on the website. And if we can't solve it, that's even better because it helps us evolve, evolve the system. So this one happens to be, uh, as you can see, finding unanticipated patterns in clinical cohorts using open clinical data, something that I think you would find uh, probably pretty useful. So uh, the products so far, they're all, they're all geek products, except for what I just showed you. So you can go to the website and do the tidbits. That's for folks like me who have trouble doing Control-Alt-Delete. But for people who actually know what they're doing, uh, you can go to GitHub, uh, and all of the code is there. Um, and, and so um, I hope you, and there's a couple papers that we wrote uh, about this too, so I hope you'll, hope you'll have a look at that. And um, I, I just finished with this one. This was a story in STAT a little while ago, which was, um, <clears throat> which was uh, nice, uh, but I, I must say uh, insulting. So why was it insulting? Uh, it was insulting because they said, we're aiming to build a Google for biomedical data. That is not what we're doing. As a matter of fact, the team has as its minimum requirement that Google cannot answer the question. If Google can answer the question, why are we going to build Google for my medical data? We already have Google. What we're trying to do is do the 20 dimensional uh, uh, relational questions that, 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 that Google can't do. Um, and, and, and of course, using data that may not be in Google, too. Um, but, but, but the point is that it's a much more multi dimensional uh, uh, approach, much like biologists and physicians think about every day. Uh, but, but the thing, I, I, I liked a lot of these quotes, uh, but, but the one I really liked was this one, all involved emphasize the importance of the collaborative nature of the project, team science. It's basically like having a menu of great ideas from all the smartest people from around the country. This is like what working with the CTSA program is like. I mean, th this is the, the, the dream team of dream teams in, in, in Translator. So the, the point I'm making, and, and, and the, the thing that I want you to take away from what, what I've told you, is that these are big, big problems. They are big problems, but they are, they are both extraordinarily exciting and eminently solvable, much more solvable than you might think, but they're not solved in, by doing things the same old, same old way. We, we have to think of doing things differently, questioning every assumption we've done, asking, well, why should we do the same thing again and expect a different result? Uh, and when we do that, when we, when we focus on, on innovation, team science, answering really important questions, uh, and doing it in an open-minded way, in an open science kind of way, collaborative way, um, the, really the sky is the limit. So I, I just want to leave you with a thanks to all of you. Uh, you may not realize uh, how much leadership your institution has provided to us over the years. Um, uh, I think I can say, well, I'm going to spill the beans anyway. I can, I'm the director. I can say whatever I want. As a result, I, I asked Becky to join our, our, uh, our, uh, my um, advisory council. Um, um, so that I can take advantage of her wisdom on an ongoing basis. I've been scheming uh, uh, to get Becky into our advisory council for the last seven years, so I finally succeeded, and she said yes. So, um, uh, so I'm really appreciative of, of, of Becky's willingness. So thank you. I don't know if
don't know if there are any questions or we have time, but I'm glad to. Okay. What an inspiring talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's really, really uh, inspiring and fascinating. But also give us, if you, we spent $26 billion in the NIH, do you think we need to cancel or delete the R01 mechanism and yeah. think about a different mechanism? Yeah, boy, isn't that a great question. Um, <clears throat> um, you know, one of the things that I worry about um, a great deal, which is related to your question, is that uh, NCATS, uh, you know, as I think I mentioned that, in fact, I know I mentioned, that um, I'm very eager to have an academic discipline of translational science, but, it, but NCATS is the only institute or center at the NIH that can train people but can't support them in their career because we have no career investigator support program. And, and I'm trying to solve that, but it's a, it's a complicated political problem. But the, but the kinds of, of support that we will offer is going to be different. Um, you know, the, 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 even the terminology we use, principal investigator. I mean, I, for what I train, I'm, I'm trained as a model organism geneticist, and so all of my first papers were two author papers. It was me and my lab head, and that, and that was fine. It works great in fundamental research. It does not work in translation. And, and so, um, so our awards are and will continue to be different um, and should be. Um, it, it, you will be interested to know, though, that, that um, the rest of NIH has begun to ask exactly the questions that you're asking. Um, and it, a, an IC Institute Director's retreat um, probably about six months ago, one of the topics on the agenda was, do we need a different mechanism? Is, is, is the R01, should it go on be as Currently, you know, R01 is very broad, but the way it's currently used, is, should it go on being the coin of the realm or not? Is it appropriate for today's needs in modern science? And just the fact that that ended up on the retreat agenda gave me great hope <laughs> um, that, 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 that I think changes are, are in the wind, and I'm very optimistic about that. Okay. Well, I think we have a next talk, so thank you again. So we actually have our poster viewing session. Um, we posters um, were prejudged before this, and awardees were given in categories for first, second, and third. Those are marked on their posters. The poster viewing is across the hall. It really gives you the opportunity, as I said, to develop networking and collaborations and ideas. Um, so please join us there, and then come back again in an hour. Um, and we'll finish up with our last two sets of presentations for the day. <laughs>